The Pacific Ocean, 100 miles southwest of Hawaii. The fast carrier USS Abraham Lincoln steams into the wind. She is a United States Navy Nimitz-class carrier, named after the World War II Admiral. The biggest, most sophisticated war machine ever built. Today's supercarrier is nuclear-powered, carries nearly 100 aircraft, and is operated by 5,000 sailors, air crew, and Marines. She is the hub of the modern carrier battle group, ruling a 500-mile radius of air, sea, and land. Flanked by her guards, Aegis missile cruisers, destroyers, and frigates, and traveling with two nuclear attack submarines riding shotgun up front. The idea of the carrier is relatively new. It wasn't even born until 1910. Since then, technology and tactics have created a vessel that is master of the seas and skies. It was a day of infamy that helped make it so. In 1941, the best naval aviation force in the world was the Imperial Japanese Navy. Early on the morning of December 7th, aircraft from six of their carriers set out to destroy the American Pacific Fleet. And in doing so, sank the battleship Navy forever. The U.S. Navy found itself left with only its carriers, which were not in Pearl Harbor that day. A new kind of war at sea had arrived. But the story of naval aviation got an unlikely kickstart from a speed cyclist and motorcycle engineer based in the little town of Hammondsport in upstate New York. His name, Glenn Curtis. Curtis was a motorcycle racer. And so he was always striving for a better engine. Curtis tried to uh, improve the power to weight ratio constantly getting more power for less weight. And that was exactly what you wanted if you were trying to fly back in those days. That got him into the air through the back door because the first dirigibles to fly in this country used Curtis motorcycle engines to power them. Heavier than air flight had been proved possible by the Wright brothers on December 17, 1903. But aviation was still very much in its infancy. Glenn Curtis made the first flight outside the Wright camp over Cayuca Lake in Pleasant Valley, New York on March 12, 1908. Buoyed by the success of his first exhibition flight later that same year, Curtis looked for ways to capitalize on his creation. The U.S. Army had already bought an, a Wright airplane in 1909, so Curtis set his sights on the Navy and tried to develop ways in which the airplane could be useful to the Navy. Glenn Curtis realized that for aircraft to be useful to the Navy, crews would have to be able to launch them at sea. In November of 1910, Curtis worked with one of his crack pilots, Eugene Ely. Together, they convinced the Navy to rig up a makeshift deck on the cruiser Birmingham, anchored in Norfolk, Virginia. And the idea was that Ely would fly off of this deck and then back to shore in order to demonstrate that it was possible to fly off the ship. Nobody had ever done this before. They rigged this up, and Ely revved up his Curtis pusher and shot forward across the deck. And when he came off the deck, he fell toward the surface of the sea. Now, the reason for this was he didn't have enough speed to get airspeed. Ely actually did hit the surface and skipped and bounced off it. And it must have been a kind of scary experience for him because he damaged his rudder 
He damaged his propeller, he soaked his clothes, and he caked over his goggles with spray. Well, the Navy was very interested in the fact that he could fly off a ship, but pointed out that, of course, that was an incomplete progression. To complete the progression, Ely joined Curtis on the West Coast, where they rigged up another makeshift deck, this time on the armored cruiser Pennsylvania. They set out to prove that a plane could land on a ship. And this time, Ely took off from Selfridge Field, and he came in for a landing on the makeshift deck on the Pennsylvania. Now, they had a problem doing that, too, because he was going to need more space to stop than the Pennsylvania offered. So they made an ingenious arrangement. They took 22 lines of hemp rope, laid them across the deck, and tied heavy sandbags to each end. And the first time anyone ever landed on a ship, he used a tail hook to catch those cables and bring himself to a stop, just like a jet-powered aircraft does today. The landing system was ahead of its time, but a platform covering the gun turrets wasn't practical. The Navy determined they needed a plane that could work alongside the ships. Curtis's solution was to develop a hydroplane that could operate from the water. While he was trying out this vessel with water testing, suddenly realized he was getting too close to shore, yanked on the wheel in order to turn himself away, and took off unexpectedly. He didn't realize he was going to do it. Uh, ships in harbor, naval ships, saw this and started hooting their whistles because they realized what he had done. Now you've got something worth talking about. Now you've got an airplane that can work along with the ships without requiring us to cover up the guns. Curtis was a great pioneer for two reasons, I think. Not only because of what's normally understood, that is his development of aircraft. He built aircraft, he designed aircraft, he tested aircraft. But also because he trained some of the Navy's pioneer aviators. Glenn Curtis set up a school to teach the Navy to fly. The Japanese also became customers. Curtis trained key officers like the U.S. Navy's John Towers. He was in charge of the aviation detachment at Guantanamo Bay when they went down for fleet exercises in 1913. Eventually, one of the officers said, well, since we're in the middle of maneuvers, why don't you take off and scout, see if you can find something? So Towers took off, and almost as soon as he got up above Guantanamo Bay, saw the, quote, enemy fleet approaching 15 miles away. So right at the very beginning of the career of submarines, and right at the very beginning of the career of dreadnought-type vessels, all of a sudden, this tiny, fragile, inexpensive aeroplane uh, was proving that they would not be able to dominate the seas. Neither one of them would be able to dominate the seas. And Glenn Curtis himself had written in the Saturday Evening Post in 1910, when an airplane costing a few thousand dollars can sink a battleship costing a million dollars, there will be some change in the composition of navies. But airplanes were not quite up to the job yet. The skies were dominated by self-propelled dirigible balloons called zeppelins, named for their inventor, a Prussian count. Balloons could stay airborne for hours, making them ideal scouts. At sea, the point of the Zeppelin is that vision. It's a scout. Scouting matters a great deal. As long as there's no serious air opposition, scouting is very effective. The British developed balloons for observation, but couldn't match the advanced Zeppelin.